Yeah. And then to go get Hannibal on now, when they first started doing the project, you know, they thought they had everything figured out, and then all of a sudden there's all this water coming up, flowing across your bench. That's just yeah. Super cool. Oh, that's interesting. All right. Well, uh, it sounds like you've been keeping up with the recorded videos, and I'm glad that that's worked out for you. Yeah, um, you know, about, I think every other is the right balance. You know, it's often enough for us to kind of keep tabs and be able to do assessments like the quizzes, and, uh, but it's uh, not so frequent that you have to come every week. And so uh, what we'll do is next Wednesday we'll be online again, and then the following week is our exam. So we'll have that be in person. So uh, today what we're scheduled to do is go over both evaporation and infiltration according to the schedule, but I'm not sure if we'll make it all the way through infiltration today. Um, I'll try and move as quickly as I can through evaporation, but we may need to also uh, push some of the infiltration meat and material into the video that I'll give you for next week. Good question. Um, what I'll allow you to do is bring in any materials whatsoever you want for the exam. Oh, okay. So you can bring and use the textbook. You can bring and use previous homework assignments. You can prepare an equation sheet. You can use the FE reference manual, whatever you want. But you can only use that resource on the second part of the exam. Uh, the first part of the exam will be concept questions, and it's just your brain and the pencil for those. Um, but then on the problem solving, the sky's the limit. You can use whatever you like. All right. All right. So we're talking about evaporation today. And just think, based on what you know, I mean, everybody's kind of splashed a puddle of water and come back later and noticed, hey, that water's gone. Uh, what factors would you assume influence how quickly water evaporates? The temperature. OK, yeah. The temperature, that's an important factor. Can you think of one more factor that? Uh, well, it may be, I don't know if this is right or wrong, mm -hmm. but the amount of energy in the area. I mean, I guess if you have like, uh, you know, full, you know, flowing energy or whatever, it may hmm. quickly put it out. OK, there. all right. I think you're on to something there. Um, and so the flow energy, I think, may be the reason why that would be the case. Well, what we'll learn er uh, later is that the specific surface area is one of the factors. And so if you have totally a calm lake that's just glassy smooth, the area that the water can is in contact with the air is just the plan view area of the lake. But if it's really windy and there's lots of waves and ripples, then looking down from above, the plan view area is not the same as the actual surface area of the water. So that if you've got those waves and ripples, then you have more surface area for the water to be evaporating from. So I think that there is some merit to what you're suggesting. One of the other really big factors is the humidity of the air. So you're thinking, uh, in temperature, you got it one of the most important factors, and that is the energy that's available to drive evaporation. But you think that water has to go somewhere. And so not only is the water leaving the liquid phase, but it's also entering the vapor phase. And so um, water is being pushed from the liquid into the air, but you can also think of it in terms of the air is reaching into the liquid and pulling it out. And so the driving force is the difference between the humidity of the air and the maximum saturation humidity for a given temperature. So we're going to get into some of those factors today. And uh, numerically, there are uh, models that have been derived that allow us to predict the evaporation rate based on just those very factors that we've talked about. Surface area, wind, temperature, humidity of the air, all of those factors. Um, so let's watch just a couple of these videos. I mean, they're mostly all the same thing. Um, I have to pause the recording. This sunny area, because it evaporated a long time ago. It's just here in the shaded area that there's any water remaining to evaporate before the time lapse even begins. And so I guess the shade starts here. And so the section that is in the sunlight evaporates quicker than the water that is in the shade. So solar radiation, I think, is one of the effects that that video illustrates. Um, the Leidenfrost effect is kind of interesting because what it shows is water that's sizzling. Uh, when you pour it onto a hot plate, the 
gas, the, the water vapor that's underneath that droplet allows it to kind of uh, dance around on the hot platter. So when you pour the liquid on there, it's so hot that it's vaporizing underneath the liquid, and that's why it kind of dances around on the skillet. Um, a lot of people have seen these uh, things that happen in Canada or, you know, the high northern territories where someone will take a boiling liquid and then throw it up into the air and it just kind of instantly turns into smoke going to the vapor phase so quickly. You know, no water droplets actually make it to the bottom. And the reason for that is that when the temperatures are really cold, oftentimes the air becomes very dry. And so then that's promoting one of the driving factors is if you have moisture, then it's going to readily go into, uh, into the atmosphere because it's so dry. But then the other thing is the temperature differential. When you have a really hot water and really cold air, then that's, uh, the hot water has a high vapor pressure. And so it is able to uh, volatilize very quickly. And one last video clip here just shows that um, it's possible to boil water at temperatures other than boiling, like 100 degrees Celsius. And so what we have here is a suction. And so this compressor is drawing um, the air surrounding the liquid. You know, there's a glass bell over the top. And just by decreasing the pressure that's above the liquid, it's boiling. And so it's not boiling because it's hot. Right. Actually, the opposite. This liquid is getting progressively cooler as the boiling occurs. Because um, as the water goes from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, there is heat required to do that. And so it's losing heat. The, the liquid is losing heat as it continues to evaporate. And so over time, what you could do is turn that into ice. And maybe you've noticed, have you ever recharged the uh, your AC on your car before, like with the cans that they sell at AutoZone. Right. So when you do that, the can gets really cold. Yeah. And that's because you have a liquid going to the vapor phase. And so it's taking heat in order to do that. Exactly right. Yeah, the canned air, you mean like for electronics, yeah, stuff yeah. like that? Yep. All right, so these are all videos that kind of play into some of the, uh, some of the trends that D determine the rate of evaporation. And uh, when we're trying to, in the end, what I'm working at today is an equation that I'm going to show you that allows you to predict how quickly water evaporates from a lake. Um, and one of the driving forces in that equation is how much solar radiation is there. And what this figure from the text, uh, the point that it makes is that the sun uh, gives radiation at a low wavelength, and so it's able to penetrate through the atmosphere, and the incoming radiation is uh, short wave radiation, but then the energy that is emitted from the Earth is long wave radiation, and so there's a difference in the wavelength of the energy. And so the thing that you need to remember is incoming radiation is short wave, outgoing radiation is long wave. And what we often do is we compare the difference between the two, and we think of that as how much energy is available to drive evaporation, the difference between the incoming and outgoing radiation. And so this is just a global energy balance to try and give a, uh, like a, a relative quantitative estimate of how much energy comes in, how much energy goes out, and where it ends up. So what you can see is that the uh, short wave radiation that's coming in from space, um, a good portion of that is actually reflected before it uh, is absorbed by the ocean or by the land. Some of it is reflected by just interaction with air. Some of it is reflected by clouds. Some of it reflected off of uh, materials at the surface, like the polar ice caps reflect energy rather than absorbing them. But about, roughly speaking, about half of the solar radiation that hits the atmosphere makes it to the surface. And when the surface absorbs that incoming shortwave radiation, it then emits, over the average, emits all of the radiation. You know, there is an equilibrium bef between the two. And if there wasn't, then the surface would be continually getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And uh, although the atmosphere is slowly getting warmer due to uh, climate change effects, that's not what this is talking about. This is kind of on a, 
on like an annual basis. All of the incoming radiation is also emitted. Uh, so some of that radiation that's emit emitted is as uh, long wave radiation uh, directly to the atmosphere, but some of it is heat flux. And there's a difference between the two. Um, if you've ever walked by a brick wall in the afternoon when the sun's been on it, like even after the sun goes down, you can walk past a brick wall and kind of feel the heat coming off of it. And that's what we think of as the net sensible heat flux. Um, it's actually it's thermally, the, the temperature you can feel. Uh, whereas the, uh, the long wave radiation isn't always sensible heat. It's sometimes just a reflection at a, uh, a longer wavelength than it came in. Um, so there is, broadly speaking, an energy balance. Um, remember that the short wave is the incoming solar. Long wave is the outgoing terrestrial. And if we take the area under the curve, that's the total amount of energy. If you integrate the flux and the wavelength, then the area under those two curves should be equal. Now one of the tricky things is that because our Earth is spherical um, and the sun's rays are coming basically parallel from the sun, um, their incident area is different at the equator than it is at the poles. And I think this figure really uh, makes it pretty clear that uh, at the equator, the incident area and the projected area is about the same. And that's why you can get a sunburn, one of the reasons why at the equator you can get a, a sunburn so readily. And I experienced that myself. I went to Kenya one time and it was amazing uh, how much faster you felt the sun on your skin in Kenya than, you know, we're used to northern Europe and, uh, or excuse me, North America, northern Europe. In the, in the northern hemisphere, um, that same solar radiation that's coming in is projected over a much larger area. And so it's just one of the reasons why solar radiation is so much more intense at the poles, and thus uh, there's more heat, excuse me, uh, solar radiation is more intense at the equator, and so there's a lot more heat at the equator. Uh, I think in the precipitation lecture we were looking at the, uh, you know, the trade winds that set up, and um, so this, you know, the, the heating at the pole, at the equator, moving towards the poles is partly because of um, more of the sun's energy being uh, absorbed at the equator. So there's the point here is there is a spatial distribution in solar radiation. So there's going to be a distribution in evaporation rate. And you maybe have heard the point that Antarctica is a desert. That, you know, although it's very snowy there, it actually in a lot of places in parts of Antarctica it uh, snows, I mean, the amount of precipitation is less than a couple of inches per year. Uh, it's just that once the snow is there, it never melts because it's so cold. And so one of the reasons why they get so little precipitation in a Antarctica is because uh, there isn't much energy to drive evaporation of the surrounding oceans. Uh, whereas there's a lot of humidity and uh, a lot of evaporation um, at the equator. So that was about spatial distribution. This slide is hinting at uh, temporal distribution, that the Earth goes through seasons as a result of uh, not what a lot of people think is the seasons are because the Earth is rotating around the sun. And that's not what causes the seasonal changes. What causes the seasonal changes is the fact that the Earth is wobbling back and forth. And so it, um, it's the, the fact that the Earth tilts to expose the, uh, the northern hemisphere to more radiation during our summer months, and the southern hemisphere is exposed to more radiation during our winter months. And so it's that astronomical seasons that causes um, differences in when we have rain and when there are dry periods in some climates. Um, okay, so the effect of humidity, um, this is sometimes tricky to conceive of because we think of the boiling point of water as being 100 Celsius. So 100 Celsius means that the vapor pressure of the water is equal to atmospheric pressure. And so that's when we expect the water to be going into the, uh, 
the gas stays. But even below this temperature, some of the water is going to evaporate. So what we draw from that is not all molecules in a glass of water, not all the molecules there have the same amount of kinetic energy. There's, if you like it, a bell curve. Some of the molecules, uh, if, if you have a glass of water and it's 20 degrees Celsius, some of the molecules are going to have very little kinetic energy. Uh, we could think of this as kinetic energy proportion. So at 20 degrees Celsius, most of the water isn't going to have enough energy to volatilize. But some of it will. Um, some, of the, some of the molecules are going to have enough kin kinetic energy that the vapor pressure of those individual molecules is enough to escape through the liquid membrane at the surface and go into the vapor phase. Um, so it's the sun that's driving the vapor into the atmosphere, and it's the heat and the energy from the sun that keeps moisture in the atmosphere, that keeps it to have enough kinetic energy that it doesn't condense into dew. You've probably heard of the dew point, and of course in the summer if you leave something out overnight, and in the morning it'll be kind of soaked because humidity from the atmosphere was condensing onto those surfaces. And that's when the atmosphere cools overnight. Uh, some of the moisture that was in the atmosphere has to absorb onto other surfaces uh, because now it's cooler and the atmosphere can't hold as much moisture as it did before. Right, some greenhouses probably good. Oh, for very cool. What are you growing in the greenhouse? Uh, right. I see. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I have a fruit tree and stuff. It's cool. just all winter in there, so it's like a sweet, healthy Yeah. It stays in my fridge most of the time. I have like a big compost pile in there. Yeah. And water and huh. water, same, same black stuff. So. It's funny you mentioned a fig tree because uh, I had two fig trees that I used to drag into my garage every right. winter, mm -hmm. and we thought, oh, this is stupid. Let's just plant them. But uh, they get big every summer, but then the cold knocks right. them back, and so we've never really got more than just two or three figs. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, um, at the molecular level, the energy is going to be driving uh, liquid into the air. And so what the heat and the radiation does is it speeds up the molecules and successive collisions, when you have five or six collisions in a row, you finally have a molecule that has enough kinetic energy to get out of the liquid phase and into the, uh, into, uh, the atmosphere. And the, uh, the amount of gas that is in the atmosphere can be measured a variety of ways. We can uh, measure uh, how much water there is as relative humidity. Uh, we can also think about the partial pressure of the uh, water in the atmosphere. You know, if we have 760 millimeters of mercury, then you can attribute um, some of the, that pressure is attributed to oxygen, some of it's attributed to nitrogen, some of it to the liquid vapor that's in the atmosphere. Um, the quantity of water molecules um, that are still in the liquid phase, I assuming that it's pure water, then what we don't necessarily have to focus on the amount of water, but the amount of energy that's there. And so the formula I'm going to show you is kind of uh, looking at how much heat is provided um, to do the work of evaporation. And there's a term called latent heat of vaporization, that is how many kilojoules of energy per kilogram of water is required. Now over the surface of the Earth, the average rate of evaporation is three millimeters per day. And that is just in places where there is a free surface of liquid, if you take into account the humidity, the energy that's available, that's just the uh, spatial average where there's a free surface of water, three millimeters per day. And so it's going to be a lot more of eva evaporation in 
uh, warm areas, especially if they're humid, uh, excuse me, especially if they're dry areas. Um, and there would be less evaporation in cold water or in climates where there isn't, um, there isn't the driving force into the air. So um, the latent heat of vaporization is temperature dependent. And what you can see here is that uh, for a kilogram of water, then we would expect it to take about 2.5 times 10 to the 6 the joules. But uh, as the water heats up, that has a slight reduction in the amount of energy required to vaporize it. So what we'll do in our equation that we're working towards is see, based on how much incoming solar radiation there is, um, how many kilograms of water per unit of time we expect to see evaporating. So this is just a joules per kilogram units here. But then what we can say is how many joules per hour or joules per day are coming in from the sun to provide the energy needed to do this work, the, the work of evaporation. This is a photo that I snapped uh, as I was driving along Route 2. I probably shouldn't be taking pictures while I drive, but I couldn't resist because uh, this is something I've seen before. And uh, this is along the Ohio River. And you can see that there's a cloud that's formed just over the river. So on either side of the river, there's no cloud. But just right above the river, there was. And uh, so this photo, I took it in the fall. When what happens in the fall is that the air is cooler than the water. You know, the water stayed relatively warm um, compared to the cold air. And so probably the air was in maybe the upper 30s or the low 40s. And the water was still probably in the 50s at this point. And so there was a lot more moisture going up into the air. And so there was just kind of a localized concentration of high humidity. And then as the air, as the liquid diffused out further away, then you didn't see the clouds anymore. I just thought that's kind of an interesting illustration. Yeah, because usually that fall, you usually have it all the way down to the water level. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I've seen sometimes there's fog that's just on the water, and it's clear above. In fact, I took some pictures of that recently. I should put them in the presentation. So solar radiation, here's another look at what we saw already, uh, the difference between the incoming and the outgoing radiation. And it's what's driving, providing the energy to do the latent heat of vaporization. Um, so the energy balance method, the, the two main approaches are, the first approach says, how much energy is there? The second approach says, how much water can the air accept? And in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to balance those two approaches, because they both play an important role. You can't have more evaporation than the energy is available to drive it. But at the same time, you can't have more air, uh, evaporation than the air is able to accept. You know, If it's 100% humidity uh, in the air above the water, then the water won't evaporate. So the first of these two approaches asks this question, how much energy is available? And uh, just briefly, we'll go through the derivation of the equation that answers that question. Um, here what we've done is we've said, let's take some amount of water and put a control surface around it. And what we're going to keep track of is we're going to keep track of all of the energy that goes in or out of those control surfaces. And then we're also going to do a mass balance on any moisture that goes in or out of those control surfaces. Um, so in the end, what we want to look at is this m dot means the mass flow of vapor through the control surface. And so the vapor flow rate the figure is showing is the density of the water, the cross-sectional area, so the area of this circular surface that we're working with. And then e is the evaporation rate. And that would have units, uh, if we think about uh, the, the density would be kilograms per cubic meter. And then the area is going to be square meters. The evaporation rate would be meters per day. So in the end, this units of m dot will be 
kilograms per day. So mass per time, how much mass of the water is going into the vapor phase. So the two different terms of this Reynolds transport theorem is that the water is going to be leaving through this control surfaces. Um, it's either the water is going to accumulate in this head space right above the, uh, the, um, the water surface, and that's the storage term, or it's going to be transported away. It's going to go uh, into the air and then higher up in the atmosphere and kind of dispersed away from the surface of the water. Um, the transport also can include, like, if there was going to be any losses uh, to the ground, like infiltration, if this was a pond. Uh, but let's just say that what we want to do for the simplest approach is, like, track the evaporation of water in a pan, like a metal pan that's impermeable. So in the case like that, there wouldn't be any storage losses down through the bottom. And what we would really want to do is focus our attention on um, how the rate of the liquid level is changing. So this height is you know, the depth of the water. And if we say that the depth of the water is changing over time, dh dt, so if the liquid level is getting less and less and less, then we know that that is going to be how much moisture is going up through this control surface. So the easiest way for us to know what m dot is, the, the rate of mass loss, is just to track how quickly the water level is going down. And that's what they actually do. They have evaporation pans where you can take a pan of water into like an area where a crop is being grown and a farmer can know how much supplementary water needs to be added by keeping track of this pan. And so if the pan is evaporating you know, an inch per day, then that farmer probably knows, well, my crops are going to be losing about 60% as much water as the pan, so I need to add however much water these crops have lost. And if there hasn't been rain, then maybe they would add 60% of an inch if the pan indicated an inch of loss. So um, this, this model is just saying that what's going into the vapor is the same water that was lost as the liquid level gets lower. So we can define the mass transfer of that vapor flow rate uh, is the same thing as the density of the water, the cross-sectional area of that liquid surface, and then E is the evaporation rate. So that was looking at the liquid phase, how quickly the water level is going down. The flip side of that is to keep track of what's happening with the actual moisture that has evaporated, you know, the moisture that went from above, went from below the surface and now is above it. Um, so remember in the previous slide what we said was m dot is related to the liquid level going down. So now m dot here, the mass flow rate of the vapor phase, can, if we say that we're in steady flow and that there isn't any accumulation of the vapor, then um, it just simplifies to uh, the cross-sectional area of the pan, the velocity that the gas is moving out, and then Q sub V would be the specific humidity, like what, percenti what percentage of the air that is moving out is water. And so um, what we're saying is the air is moving over the surface uh, the incoming air is dry, the outgoing air is moist, and so by looking at the change in moisture in the air, we can relate that to the, uh, the rate of liquid loss as well. So now E is defined as the rate of evaporation from the perspective of how much water is getting into the vapor phase. And so we set the two equal to each other. Let me just uh, jump to the conclusion here. The incoming solar radiation, R sub i, that's the incoming shortwave radiation. Um, it can either be reflected or it can be absorbed. Um, and then there's also the energy that's emitted, R sub e. And so R sub i is the incident radiation that's coming in from the atmosphere. 
uh, alpha r sub i is how much radiation is reflected, and then r sub e is the emitted radiation. So the rate of loss of water is related to how much energy is available. And so the, the net radiation, r sub n, is the difference between what comes in and what goes out. So this is how much energy, in terms of joules, there is to drive the latent heat of vaporization. And then we subtract out you know, the heat that's lost through that uh, sensible effect, you know, the brick wall that's emitting a heat that you can feel. Well, water, a, a pan of water, also emits some energy, some of it to the ground, some of that air is being emitted to, uh, some of the heat is being emitted to the air. Um, but we can calculate the net radiation and the evaporation rate is simply the ratio of the net radiation and the latent heat of vaporization times the density of the water. So if, if we look at the units, what we'll get out of E is length per time. Um, and we'll do an example just to get some practice with that. Um, so this is a picture of a lagoon um, in a city that I used to live in called Sharjah over in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, it's very sunny there, lots of radiation. And this inland lagoon is actually a little bit more saline than the ocean that surrounds it because it has so much evaporation and it leaves the salts behind in that lagoon. So there's a little bit of circulation and some currents in that lagoon, but it does have some increased salinity because there's a lot of evaporation. Let's try and go through these calculation steps just as an illustration to uh, take a look at how you'd estimate just based on the energy availability, how you'd estimate the rate of evaporation in these cases. So let me do it here on the whiteboard. So you've got the, uh, the printout that shows the assignment parameters. Let me do this. I'll bring it up in the recording so that if uh, if anyone is following along on the recording, they'll be able to watch this example. Okay, the handout, or the, the, the notes, say that there's some constants that we can go with. First of all, um, alpha is how reflective the water is. And so the reflectivity, or the albedo of the water, as it's called, is 0 0.35. And that just means that 35% of the radiation that hits the water, on average, is going to be reflected off. There's also another constant we have to define, the irradiation emissivity of water. E is 0 0.995. Uh, there's another physical constant uh, called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And so that is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8th watts per meter squared times Kelvin to the 4th. And then finally, the, uh, the temperature of the water, as it's defined here, is 26 degrees Celsius. Is that right? Does the handout say 26 Celsius? All right. Yeah, so the water temperature is uh, 26. And we need to know that in Kelvin. So we add plus 273.15 Kelvin. It's 299.15 Kelvin is the temperature of the water. Okay, so the first thing we'll calculate is the radiation that's emitted. 
R sub E. Um, so E is the stuff on Boltzmann constant. T sub P, where that is the, uh, the temperature of the, uh, the water to the fourth. Okay, so this is just how much, based on the temperature of the water, how much um, outgoing long wave radiation it's emitting. Okay, so it's 0 0.995 times 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And that's times 299.15 Kelvin to the fourth power. Okay, so 451.8 watts per meter squared. That's the outgoing radiation just based on the temperature of the water. So now we want to find out what's the net radiation available to drive evaporation. So net radiation for evaporation. Okay, so R sub N, the net radiation is going to be the uh, incoming incident radiation multiplied by 1 minus alpha minus R sub E. Okay, so the incident radiation, it says that uh, it is 978 watts per square meter. And that's something that you'd measure with a radiometer. That's an instrument that you set out in the sun, and it just kind of measures the intensity of the sunshine. If you don't have that meter, Radiation intensity can also be estimated based on latitude and atmospheric conditions. Uh, there's data that's available online that's measured solar radiation at a few uh, like gauging stations across the country. So 978 watts per meter squared is what's coming in. And we know that 35% of that is going to be reflected. So 1 minus 35% says 65% of that won't be reflected. So that 65% of 978 is how much is available to drive evaporation. But we also have to, to subtract out the amount of energy that is being emitted by the water due to its temperature because however much is being emitted as long wave has to be replaced. Otherwise, the water is going to be losing its temperature. So in this case, the, uh, the net radiation is 183.9 watts per square meter. So that is 978 times 0.65, and then subtract out the long wave emitted radiation. So the sun is providing in every square meter of area 183.9 watts per meter. Now um, let's look at the latent heat of vaporization, L sub V. It's 2.501 times 10 to the sixth minus uh, 2370 times the temperature of the water. Okay, the temperature of the water is 26 Celsius. So we put this, the units are a little confusing because sometimes it's Kelvin, sometimes it's Celsius. Here, this formula that we have for the latent heat of vaporization, the temperature should be in Celsius. And so what that means is that it's 2,439,380 joules are required to vaporize a kilogram of water. So I think you can probably see where this is heading. We know how much energy is being delivered by the sun. We know how much energy is required by a kilogram of water to evaporate. And uh, now what we have to do is take the uh, density of the water into account. Uh, so at the temperature that's described, the density of water is 996.3 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's for the water at 26 degrees Celsius. So the evaporation rate, E sub R, is going to be the net radiation 
divided by the latent heat of vaporization times the density of the water. And we'll pay special attention to the units here to make sure that it all cancels out the way that it should. We'll substitute in 183.9 watts per meter squared, and then 2,439,380 joules per kilogram, and 996 point three kilograms per cubic meter. Seven point five seven times ten to the minus eight meters per second. Now, how do we get that? Let's look at these units here. Um, so, a a watt is a joule per second, right? And uh, a joule is a newton meter. So now we have newton meter per second. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And that's times meters. And seconds was also down in the denominator. So you know, we're able to cancel out this kilogram. It introduces a time component. And uh, in the end, if we cancel everything out, what this is saying is that it's 7.57 uh, times 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. And if we multiply that by uh, 86,400 seconds per day, and we multiply that by 1,000 millimeters in a meter, then this evaporation rate is 6.54 millimeters per day. And you always want to do kind of a reasonableness check to see well, how does this match up with what I know to be real in the world. And the uh, ballpark figure that I told you earlier was that you know, the average across the Earth is about 3 millimeters per day in a free surface of water. And so it makes sense to me that in this case, it would be more than that average, because this is at a relatively uh, middle latitude where there's a lot more energy, you know, high radiation intensity. So we'd expect to see a little bit more evaporation than normal, but it's still within an order of magnitude, well within. So this is just saying the limiting factor is how much energy that gets delivered. And if there's enough radiation there to vaporize it, we're not going to consider here, we haven't considered how much water the air is even able to accept. So it's just, this is called the energy method because it focuses exclusively on the energy that's delivered to the water. Any questions about that so far? I know that's a lot of. Not yet. Oh. Yeah, I've provided the air temperature in the problem statement because what we're going to do is we're going to shift from this energy example, and now I'm going to show you the what's called the aerodynamic method, and the aerodynamic method. It says, well, let's forget about how much energy is being provided by the sun, but let's instead look at how saturated is the air with water vapor? So here's some important concepts. I, I, I know there's a lot of calculations, and you didn't get a chance to actually punch the numbers into your own calculator. And that's kind of what you need before an example like this really makes sense. But since we're speeding through things, um, you'll have to get that same practice on the homework assignment that's associated with this stuff. But the, uh, the latent heat of vaporization is the amount of energy required to evaporate a kilogram of water. 
the name of the radiation emitted by the Earth. That's the, uh, the long wave radiation. And the energy method estimates how much uh, energy is delivered by the sun to the water. And the energy method just says that it's an energy limited process. But what we know is it's not just an energy limited process, that there are other factors that also affect evaporation. And one of the important factors is uh, how quickly the water vapor can be transported away from the surface. Because when that molecule first evaporates and is still very close to the surface, there can be a localized region, like a thin film, where the uh, humidity is 100%, just right next to that uh, liquid air interface. And so if it's a really windy day, and it's moving that water vapor away from the location where it was evaporated, you know, and that could be up through the air column, or it could be sideways. Um, as it's moving the water vapor away, then that increases the driving force in evaporation. And the driving force in the context of the aerodynamic method is how different is the amount of the water that's in the air and how much water could be in the air if it was fully saturated. This graph is showing um, the wind velocity as you get higher further away from the surface. This velocity profile says that because of the no-slip condition of fluids, that you know, there is a frictional resistance to the movement of a fluid. And so even if the air is moving sideways, if you get down really close to the surface, it's not moving as much as it is when you get further up into the atmosphere. In fact, I, said, I saw a headline in the newspaper yesterday that there was a, uh, a plane, I think it was Virgin Airways plane, that was flying from Los Angeles to London, and it was up in the jet stream, and they had a 200 mile per hour tailwind. And so they were able to get a ground speed of more than 800 miles per hour as they flew towards London because they were so far away from the Earth's surface that you know, up in the upper atmosphere, the winds can move very, very quickly. And uh, so they're going more than 800 miles an hour because they had that really big tailwind. But when you're down close to the surface, the winds are much lower. So what that means is that um, if the wind speed is low in, in the vicinity of that liquid surface, then um, the limiting factor might be the rate of transport away from the water surface. And the other strange thing that we have to take into account is that the further up in the atmosphere you get, the cooler the air becomes because of the adiabatic lapse rate and the effect of air cooling as it expands. Uh, that also plays a role in the rate of evaporation. So the aerodynamic method is going to take all of this into account. It's going to take into account the wind velocity at a certain elevation. It's going to look at the air temperature, because the air temperature governs the humidity of the air and uh, the maximum possible humidity. And so this figure is showing that because the air temperature decreases, so does the specific humidity. You know, the, the amount of moisture that can be held in the air decreases as the temperature goes down. So if you have a desert and you pour water out into a pan, the water is going to evaporate really quickly because it's dry air. But if you move that same pan of water into a tropical area that's really humid, um, even if it's the same amount of solar radiation as you had in the desert, the water isn't going to evaporate as quickly. The aerodynamic method is going to give us a way to account for that. Here are the formulas. Um, what we have to do is we first, I should reorder them. We start at the bottom on this one. Um, we have to know the relative humidity, that's what R sub H is indicating is, um, you get an idea of how saturated is the air already with moisture. And uh, once you've, uh, you know the, the relative humidity, 
and you're also able to estimate the saturation vapor pressure. Like if the water, if, if we completely filled the air with water, how much would there be? Because the driving force is the difference between the two. The difference between how saturated is the air and how saturated could the air be. And so the reason why we have lots of evaporation in the desert is because the difference between these two terms would be big. Um, and then B is just kind of a, a vapor transfer coefficient that says for a certain plan view area, uh, how many millimeters per day of water is going to evaporate. And that depends on the wind speed. And so here the letter U is the, uh, the velocity of the wind at a certain height that you can put in the, uh, the height that you're measuring the wind velocity. But this denominator term here in B uh, also is taking into account how big are the waves. So Z naught, the water surface roughness height, uh, is that effect that we were talking about at the beginning of class where if you have a, a glassy, very calm water surface, then there isn't as much surface area for the water to evaporate from as compared to a really choppy surface is going to have more cross-sectional area to evaporate from. So this aerodynamic method by itself is ignoring the amount of energy that's available for um, evaporation. And it's just saying, let's look at wind and let's look at humidity to try and predict um, how much moisture can be accepted by the air. Okay, so same example here, uh, same air temperature we know in this case. Uh, in the previous example, we were given the liquid temperature, but we don't need the liquid temperature for the aerodynamic model. We're using 1.7 meter per second uh, wind speed, relative humidity 75%. So let's go through the calculations just to see how we can calculate the evaporation rate if it's just based on how much water can be accepted by the air. Um, let me just pull this one up here and let's see what the substitutions were. All right. Um, so we have the air temperature, the relative humidity, the wind speed at a certain elevation, and the elevation that we have this data it said it's at uh, 1.7 meters per second at 2 meters above the surface. And then 0 0.03 centimeters, that means it's relatively calm conditions at the water surface. It's not huge choppy waves. It's a relatively smooth surface there. So we have to make sure it's in consistent units. So the, the two meters will convert over to 200 centimeters. That's the elevation that we're measuring the wind speed. And then the, uh, the height of the roughness of the waves, 0 0.03 centimeters. OK. So E sub A S, this is if the air is totally saturated, how much moisture would be in it? Um, you know, based on the temperature of the air, if you pack all of the water molecules into the air that it can hold, then the partial pressure of moisture in the air would be 3893 pascals. And atmospheric pressure at sea level is 101,325 pascals. And so what this is saying is that it's, the air is about 3.5% moisture if it's fully saturated at this temperature. But the problem says that it's already 75% humidity. And so that's pretty high humidity. Um, and so currently, we have a vapor pressure of water of 2919 pascals. And so it's the difference between the two that's going to go into calculating our evaporation rate. Um, so here now, to get this factor B is the wind speed and at what elevation we measure the wind speed relative to the uh, roughness of the wave height. And so this term B has units of a certain number of millimeters per day 
for every pascal of pressure difference between the saturation vapor pressure and the actual vapor pressure. Um, so what we can see from this example, it's only saying 2.2 millimeters per day compared to when we looked at the same conditions just from how much energy is available, um, there's a lot more energy available than the moisture can be, evapor can be accepted by the air. So um, the solar radiation is not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is going to be that it's already pretty humid and there's not as much wind speed as we'd need to maximize the evaporation rate. So we have to now blend these two. You know, how much evaporation there is, it's a little bit, it's in the middle between the two. And so um, the combined method is an approach that says it's very rare for you to have unlimited energy and it's very rare for you to have unlimited transport. And so in most cases, you're going to have a mixture between the two. And the, uh, the way to average them is to, rather than just taking a simple average, you know, add it and divide by two, we can be a little bit more scientific than that by looking at some properties that have to do with the temperature of the air, the specific heat of uh, the air, uh, the, the pr atmospheric pressure. And so this averaging system says uh, you can calculate what's known as the psychometric constant, and that's gamma. And just based on typical, uh, the typical latent heat of vaporization, the typical atmospheric pressure, a, tip, a, a good value to use for gamma is 66.8 pascals per degree Celsius. And then this delta term, we have to take into account what's the actual uh, temperature of the air and the uh, saturation vapor pressure. They call this uh, a gamma term the gradient of the saturated vapor pressure curve. So in the example that we just worked, we know the air temperature and we know E sub A S. So what we can do is calculate gamma and then average the two. You average the radiation uh, derived evaporation rate and you average the uh, transport derived evaporation rate. And so this is what that looks like, the combined method where we say if we only were looking at how much energy there is, it's 6.5. We only look at how much uh, the air is getting moved through the, uh, through the, the transport of the vapor. It's 2.2 millimeters per day. And so we can calculate this term uh, delta and use the psychometric constant as well. And what you see is that it's saying about 77% of the evaporation should be weighted based on the energy method. About 23% of the evaporation should be weighted based on the uh, uh, transport. And so we're somewhere in between. Uh, according to the combined method, we would expect to see about 5.6 millimeters per day. Now there is one other shortcut method to uh, estimate the amount of evaporation and the Priestley-Taylor approximation says, well, we sometimes don't even have to bother calculating the aerodynamic method. We can just use the energy method only and then multiply that by 1.3 times the ratio of delta and delta plus gamma. So the Priestley-Taylor approximation says if all we have is the radiation method, then we can average, we can estimate the, uh, the evaporation rate from that. But this, this full combined method is more accurate. It's better if you do know what the wind speed is or if you can make a measurement of the wind speed, it's better to use that for estimating the uh, evaporation rate. Uh, this example has an unusually high humidity, and so that's why the, uh, the evaporation 
that is due to the aerodynamic component is so low compared to what the uh, energy is available to drive it. All right, so um, that is the evaporation method. And in reality, you can use that to predict what evaporation will be. And then you can also use physical measurement of observed pan evaporation. And so farmers and hydrologists and weather people can set out a known depth of water and then just watch how quickly does that water level go down. And it can be as simple as taking a measurement with a ruler every so often to see the liquid level go down. Or there can be uh, really complicated and fancy weather stations set up that measure the wind speed and the temperature. And then there's, you can see a little bit of a, uh, there's like a tub that's floating on that lake. And they'd measure the liquid level inside the tub and how it's going down to understand the amount of evaporation that is occurring through the entire lake. Uh, rainfall, you have to measure the rainfall. Oh, so it would be the net difference. Yeah, good point that you know the rain could refill it. And so you need to, to have a sense for how much of the, the liquid level change would be the difference between the original amount, the rainfall amount, and the difference would be evaporation. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're actually doing this, if you're actually taking measurements with a pan, then there are tables that tell you how to relate how much evaporation you saw in the pan to whatever crop you're working with. Because water evaporates from a pan more easily than it evaporates from, say, uh, grass. You know, there's, you maybe have heard the phrase evapotranspiration before. And what evapotranspiration is when water is being lost through the skin of a plant. And so it's a little bit more difficult for the water uh, to go through the small pores of a plant skin than to evaporate from just the free surface of a liquid. So um, pan evaporation usually overestimates how much evaporation you'd actually see in grass. And so what this table is saying is that these decimals are a percentage of the evaporation you'd see with a grass compared to a pan. So if you had moderate wind speed and the air humidity is medium, so we're here in this range, and then the pan is located um, how much of an upwind fetch of a green crop there is. Now what this is a little tricky, but what it means is that if your pan is downstream, downwind of 1,000 feet of a green crop, then the evaporation constant is going to be one thing. But if your pan only has one foot of crop upwind of it, then because the, the crop itself is humidifying the air as there's evaporation. So they kind of look at a lot of factors to know what the, the pan coefficient should be. They look at the wind speed, the humidity, and then where is the pan located compared to the rest of the crop. But the way that you'd estimate ET, that stands for evapotranspiration, you'd estimate the, the crop evapotranspiration by comparing the pan evapotranspiration and then multiplying it by a pan coefficient. So. Um, just to give you a sense of, of how this works. Let's say that we have a crop in northeast Ohio, and the wind is 2.7 meters per second. The relative humidity is 65%. And then the pan is surrounded on all sides by 100 meters of dry fallow. And the pan has 4.2 millimeters of evapor evaporation per day. Then what we want to do is understand how much evaporation would you have from irrigated grass. Um, so the monthly reference evaporation, evapotranspiration for short irrigated grass turf. So what we do is go back to this chart, and 2.7 meters per second gets us in the moderate wind. Um, 
65% humidity is in the medium range, and then surrounded on all sides by 100, to 100 meters. So the pan coefficient is going to be 0.75. So if the pan coefficient, uh, oh, wait, I, uh, I'm doing this in case B because it's surrounded by dry, bare area, not surrounded by a crop. So the example is saying dry fallow, and fallow is a bare area. So medium humidity, moderate wind, and 100 meters is this pan coefficient of 0.6. So what you do is you multiply 0.6 by the observed evaporation of 4.2 millimeters per day. And what that says is that the, uh, the actual soil and the plants on the soil are going to be evapotranspirating 2.5 millimeters per day, so less than the pan itself would. And then if you extrapolate that over a monthly period, then we'd expect to see 75.6 millimeters per month of, of a, evapotranspiration. And then the question, how much irrigation water should you provide, you'd have to know how much precipitation there was. So you'd need to look at the rainfall patterns. And um, if there is less than 75.6 millimeters per month of rainfall, then you'd provide the uh, you'd provide the irrigation to make up the difference between the two. Otherwise, the crop could wilt. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Um, let's take a quick break. It's 5.44. We go until 6.20. So let's take a quick break, and then we're going to talk a, about some of the basics of infiltration. Um, and... Uh, so let's pick up in. All right. Um, what we'll do with the rest of our time is get into uh, some of this information about the movement of water through the subsurface. And so, you know, we're trying to have a general idea of how much water is coming from the sky and where does it go when it hits the surface. Um, and actually, even before it gets to the surface, there are some other abstractions it can encounter. You know, like the water can uh, have to wet tree, uh, the outside of a tree. That's, that interception is, uh, is an important abstraction. There can be water uh, having to wet the surface of a building. When there is a, a lot of skyscrapers in an urban area, then that can play an important part of reducing the amount of precipitation that gets to the ground level. But eventually, some water is going to get to the ground. And uh, so we need to know how much of it's going to infiltrate into the soil, because whatever doesn't infiltrate is the problematic runoff that can cause flooding on the one hand, or can be an important resource uh, for irriga irrigation and for storing and capturing water to be used later. Um, so uh, we'll just revisit a couple of concepts that um, I'm sure you've seen before, um, maybe in a soil mechanics or a geotechnical engineering course. Um, what, what we will look at is how the soil properties influence the movement and behavior of water. And um, you probably remember that what's unusual about clay particles is how small they are. And clay particles, because they're so small, they have a really strong charge. Whenever you have um, like a colloidal particle, like a clay with a really small uh, particle size, it has a strong negative charge on the outside. And so these electrostatic forces affect how water is able to move through uh, the clay because water is a polar molecule. So we have a polar molecule that is attracted to the clay. And that makes it much more difficult for water to move through clay than compared to like sand, for instance, where the void sizes in between sand grains is really large. So you think about a pipe. Water is flowing through the pipe, so to speak, of the interconnected voids in sand. And if the void size is large, it's like water flows through a big pipe with very little resistance. But then, if you consider the interconnected voids in clay, 
it's a really small diameter pipe that water can move through much more slowly. And so the hydraulic conductivity takes that effect into account, not only the size of the void, but also the hydraulic conductivity is going to take into account the attraction that the liquid molecule has with the solid that's there. And sand also has a negative charge, but because the size of the particle, sand particles are so much larger than clay particles, the charge uh, isn't as intense. Um, so when we later on start to look at some models that approximate how quickly water penetrates down into the subsurface, um, some of the things we have to address is what kind of a soil it is. And there is a soil texture triangle that kind of is a way of visualizing the relative ratio of sand, clay, and silt. And then what we call uh, soil is determined by the percentage of each of those three constituents. And so, um, you know, in places where they're really fortunate to have large particle sizes and the water infiltrates really easily, like in the coastal plain areas of North Carolina, South Carolina, where there's a lot of sandy soils, the water can infiltrate really quickly. Here in West Virginia, I'm sure you already know, what we mostly have is clay soils. And so clay soils are just a real challenge, not just from a structural standpoint, but also uh, water doesn't infiltrate as easily into clay soils. So um, some of the other terms that we have to be aware of when we're classifying the soil types and looking at the hydrologic implications uh, is the porosity of the soil. So porosity is just the ratio of the pore space, or you can think of it as the pore volume, relative to the overall volume of a soil sample. And generally speaking, what's kind of ironic is that clay soils typically have a higher porosity than sandy soils do. And so from if you were just considering porosity on its surface, you might think that water is able to travel through clay more easily than sands. Uh, because you know the more pore space there is, in theory, the easier it should be for water to go through it. But it's not just the porosity, of course. It's also the size of those pores, rather than just the fraction of the pores that really counts. Field capacity is an important characteristic, because what the field capacity describes is how much moisture is left in the soil after it drains by gravity. So after, after it's rained, and the water has had a chance to drain out of a soil, how much how much water is still in there you know, without any temperature being added, if it's just gravity drained. And we can see that the clay soils hold on to a much greater pr uh, proportion of water than the sandy soils do. They'll drain out to where the water is just wetting the outside surface of a sand grain. But the voids that are large, the water drains out of those large voids really easily whereas the voids are smaller in clay soils, and so less of the water has drained out um, after precipitation. Now, if it's fully saturated, then the, uh, the water content will be equal to the porosity. So when during the storm, you know how this is saying the field capacity is after precipitation and after draining, so the, the water content can be a maximum at the porosity and then through draining, it will go down to the field capacity. But then the wilting point addresses how much the uh, soil is holding on to the water and won't actually even give it up to plants where the root structure is going down through the soil. And so the wilting point of 20% for clay, what that means is that um, at 20% water content, the clay is going to hold on to any remaining water with so much force that the soil isn't able to extract, uh, that, that a plant isn't able to extract it from the soil. Whereas clays, uh, but on the other spectrum, the, the sands don't hold on to the moisture as tightly, and so you could get down to 5% uh, water and still get um, plants able to extract the water from that fine soil. So the interpretation of all three of these trends, I think, is that the moisture moves more easily in sandy soils than it does through clay soils. Um, 
So underground, the, uh, in the unsaturated zone, meaning above the water table, where air is in some part of the voids, you know, the voids are partly moisture, partly air in the unsaturated zone. Down there, um, we can think of uh, how eager the soil is to accept additional moisture. And it actually creates a suction tension um, in the unsaturated zone that we can measure by pouring water into the soil. And uh, you may remember the capillary effect, probably in your fluid mechanics course. The capillary effect maybe even was something that you did a lab on, uh, where if you dip a small diameter glass tube into water, then the water level rises. Uh, and the smaller the diameter of the glass tube, the higher the water level will rise because the surface tension force is proportionally greater than the weight of the water that's acting downward in a small diameter tube. So we can do an experiment to see how eager the water, uh, how eager the soil is to receive additional water. And it's a soil property that we can measure this uh, tension pressure, where if you have a tube that's full of water and you stab that tube down into the soil, then the uh, soil sucks the water out of the tensionometer and it creates a vacuum in the headspace and the intensity of that vacuum can be measured with the gauge and we can graph as a function of how saturated the soil already is what the tension is for different types of soils. So a clay soil that is not saturated is going to have a really high tension pressure but then as you start off with more water in the soil, then it's not going to suck the water out of this tube with quite as much force. And of course, a, a sandy soil would never have as much of a suction force because it just doesn't have the same attractive potential between the water molecules and the soil grain as you've got with clay. So this is a physical experiment that we can do and it helps to explain the movement of water through the unsaturated zone. Um, below the water table, we sometimes call the zone below the water table as the, the saturated zone uh, or you know, the water table above it. Sometimes it's called the Vados zone. That phrase is used a lot in uh, like environmental uh, engineering. Uh, it's also called the zone of aeration. But it's the, uh, the water, the, the rain that comes from the sky and then hits the ground surface, how quickly it infiltrates down into the soil determines how much water would be then running over the surface. And so um, it's the movement in this unsaturated zone that describes uh, how quickly the water moves towards like a stream. If there is a, uh, a stream or a pond that's adjacent to the surface, then that inner flow can be an important part there. Uh, how easily the water can be absorbed by plants and evapotranspirated back into the atmosphere. Um, this figure is, uh, it is a representation of the amount of water and the pressure head. And uh, it's negative here because it's a suction. It's the similar kind of ex experiment we saw with the tensionometer where um, if the water is fully saturating all of the voids, then there isn't going to be a suction tension pressure at all. Um, a certain amount of pressure head will take you down to the field capacity, which is, remember, it's just draining by uh, gravitation. The wilting point is where plants are no, ab no longer able to get water out of the soil. And so after a storm event and after it's totally drained, this range is how much water is available in the soil for plants to use. And then uh, the hydroscopic water is just the tightly held uh, thin liquid layer that's around the outside of the soil grain. And so we say that any amount of water between there and air dried or oven dried is just totally un unavailable for use by plants. So this profile 
is saying the, uh, the amount of water as you get further down into the soil from the surface. So here's the water table, and it's fully saturated. And so the pressure uh, is going to be increasing as you go down into the groundwater because you know, that's the slope of that line is going to be the unit weight of the water. As you go down into the groundwater, the pressure is increasing. But it's a negative pressure as you go above that because of the soil tension effect. So here in the capillary fringe, there's a little bit more water than there is in the intermediate zone because as you're closer to the water table, some of the water gets sucked up from the groundwater and it's not fully saturating all of the voids, but some of the smaller diameter voids have a little bit more water than they would in the intermediate zone. And then here at the surface is where when it rains, there can be a wave of water that floods down really quickly uh, from the surface, and so uh, the equations that predict how readily water will be accepted by the subsurface look at this profile of pressure and look at a profile of water content and try and mimic what happens during uh, there being a ponding at the, at the surface. Like when there's a sudden influx of water, then that water is going to be sucked down from above, but then over time, there will be a declining potential rate of infiltration because the driving force decreases. So infiltration is simply just the amount of water that's penetrating into the soil and the rate of that water. And it can depend on um, whether you have vegetation at the surface um, because having plant roots that penetrate down into the soil can help promote the movement of water down through the surface. Whereas if it's a, uh, like a dusty surface with lots of fine grains, uh, like a fine grain dust clogging up the pores, then water isn't able to infiltrate quite as easily. And so if the soil has been disturbed at the surface or compacted, then those are both effects that can reduce the amount of infiltration. Um, so it's partly what's at the surface, but then it's also in large part what what type of soil there is uh, below the surface, so the porosity, hydraulic conductivity, and so on, the conditions of the soil underneath the surface. Um, so the unsaturated flow is just movement of the water where there is some air in the voids. So below the water table, all of the voids are fully saturated with liquid, but above the water table, it's not that the soil is totally dry, it's just that the voids are partly air and partly moisture, some mix of the two. So the soil moisture will gradually increase as a wetting front moves down through the soil column during a rainfall until it becomes saturated. And that water table can rise when it's rainy and it can fall when it's dry weather. And uh, the movement of the water table also affects how quickly the water infiltrates down into the soil. This is showing beneath the uh, surface. Once it starts raining, where does the water go? And so this is showing the rate relative to the precipitation rate, like how quickly, for instance, uh, how the infiltration rate changes over time. And this is really the most important of all of these rates. It, as engineers, we're mostly worried about how quickly is runoff coming from the uh, coming from the surface. And so the, this curve is called the declining rate of potential infiltration. So at the beginning of a storm, when it just starts to rain, you have a high rate of infiltration. But then the rate of infiltration decreases because as the voids get filled with water, there's less of a driving force. The suction pressure decreases when the, when the soil isn't isn't dry anymore, it's not going to be as eager to accept additional water. So this is a curve that we see repeated over and over again, regardless of what method we use to predict infiltration rate. The, the declining potential rate of infiltration is an important factor. Now the rest of these trends, we can also you know, be aware of the fact that the amount of surface storage is also going to be declining as all of the ponds 
and the puddles get filled up during a rainfall event, then the amount of available storage to accept additional water is also decreasing. This is some of the terms that I think are on that handout that I've shared with you before. You know the terminology handout. So the zone of saturation is below the water table where all of the voids are full. The zone of aeration means that it's partly air, partly moisture above the water table. So the atmospheric gases can circulate in the zone of aeration. And we can further divine, uh, divide the zone of aeration up into other categories. The capillary zone is what's closest to the, uh, to the water table where there's just a little bit of extra water being sucked up into the fringe. The soil water zone is closest to the surface and sometimes the moisture content is a little bit higher in the soil water zone where the vegetation root is found and is able to kind of enhance the infiltration of water. So this is showing the, uh, the cutaway and each of those three zones, capillary is closest to the water table, soil water zone is closest to the surface. And um, so this is water content. As you get down to the water table, the moisture content is saturated. As you get further away from the water table, the moisture content decreases until you get to some minimal moisture content. And this is before a storm starts. Think about once the water starts to hit the ground surface, then the moisture content is going to increase at the surface the most. And I want to jump really quickly to a video that highlights some of these trends. And uh, we won't have time to watch all of this video, but the, it's so good at illustrating the movement of the uh, movement of the water through the uh, through the soil that I want to spend. I guess we've got seven minutes left. We'll include some of that for today, and then I'll send you the link so that you can watch the rest outside of class. So let me jump ahead. They're setting up a. Uh, model and filling it with sand just so people can get a sense for different effects that uh, adjust how quickly water moves. This is really interesting watching the water flow through the uh, yeah, cool. and it's at first it's hard to understand like why the water isn't getting into the sand. Right. She said it's because there isn't enough tension for the water to go from the loam into the sand. And so you have to kind of think about, like, what's the pressure of the water? And the, the pressure is negative uh, until it's fully saturated, and then the pressure is zero. So what we're seeing here, this wetting front, it's not fully saturated. It's fully saturated here, and now finally this section is fully saturated, so there's a low enough pressure inside of the loam um, but uh, yeah, kind of the, the all, all, all mm -hmm. yeah, so when I prepare the, uh, the recording for next week's lecture, I'll also give you the link for this so you can uh, watch the rest. Let's just uh, take one last look at these announcements, though, to make sure we're on the same page about what's going on next week. Well, I expect this is stuff to kind of be more in this restriction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the sand has a lower a much higher hydraulic conductivity, but it's not just about the hydraulic conductivity, it's also right. the, uh, the pressure that the water exists at. All right, so here we are. Um, next week, the class is online, and then the following week, we'll have our first uh, midterm exam. I'll grade the quiz, and we'll upload the score as quick are as I'm able. No, I hadn't planned on doing that, but I'd be glad to share them with you if you think that would be useful. Definitely. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense.